After the release of the first two Fallout games in the late 90s, Interplay, the original developer and publisher of the Fallout series, was at an impasse. The company had seen significant financial issues since 1998, and by the time we would see the next entry in the Fallout series, Fallout Tactics, in 2001, Titus Software would complete their acquisition of the company. This next chapter in the Fallout saga would be a drastic change of pace to what fans of the series had come to expect from the game. Microforte, an Australian electronic entertainment company, would take the helm of the development of tactics, with the strategy division of Interplay, 14 degrees east, covering the publishing duties. Microforte had worked on titles like Enemy Infestation and Demon Stalkers. More majorly, Microforte worked on massively multiplayer online games technology, partially funded by grants from the Australian government, with their work ultimately leading to Big World Technology, one of the leading middleware solutions available for developers of online games. The development team wouldn't be the only thing different about Fallout Tactics. The gameplay would see a significant shift, now acting as a squad-based action game. Regardless of this change, Fallout Tactics was well received, garnering good reviews at release. Over time, Tactics has been roped in with Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, the black sheep of the Fallout family, probably due to the similar name, as the retail name for Tactics is Fallout Tactics Brotherhood of Steel which may cause some confusion when people new to the catalog start to go back to the classics. This has led many newer fans of the series to skip over Fallout Tactics as it seems weird and different to them. That mixed with the reputation the aforementioned Fallout Brotherhood of Steel may have rubbed off on it. I remember personally going to Wizards of the Coast with my friends back in the day and getting a spot on the PCs there and hopping on a land to play Tactics. We would do battles in the multiplayer settings that the game had and it was a blast. I was just as big of a Fallout fan then as I am now, and it was a dream come true to play any type of Fallout with my friends. Another thing my friends do is subscribe to the channel when they're digging the videos and want to see more Fallout content. People who do that are pretty radical. Though the multiplayer was a lot of fun, Tactics had a substantial single player experience, though far more linear than most fans of the series were used to. It still provides a great story, fun random encounters, and familiar character building that once you get over the differences of the game, come together nicely in an attractive package. Judging by statistics, it's safe to say you, watching the video right now, have not played Fallout Tactics. Admittedly, it's one of the Fallout games that I have the least amount of experience in. I'm sure some of you have played it, don't get me wrong, I'm speaking statistically. It's often overlooked and cast aside, but in this video, I want to go over why Fallout Tactics is underrated. You know what? I'm about to say it. Okay, say it. Fallout Tactics is underrated. Fallout Tactics was released March 15, 2001, and would be the third game released in the Fallout universe and the first to feature multiplayer. The game would shift to what the devs call continuous turn-based combat, which promised near-real-time action on the battlefield. With these gameplay structures in order, we would follow the story of a Midwestern Brotherhood of Steel initiate and their squad. Bethesda, now owner and developer of the Fallout series, has declared Fallout Tactics non-canon except for major pivotal events due to minor inconsistencies with the past games. Bethesda has gone on to confirm some of the events in Fallout Tactics as canon, like in Fallout 3 where scribe Rothschild says that there is a small rogue squad of Brotherhood of Steel in Chicago, and in Fallout 4 where Lancer Captain Kellis tells the sole survivor that the Brotherhood has developed airships in the west long before which are likely to be destroyed. These of course reference the Midwestern Brotherhood and some events described in Fallout Tactics. According to now series writer, Bethesda's Emil Pagliarillo. One of the significant reasons Tactics is considered non-canon is the way the Brotherhood of Steel finds their footing in the backstory. Fallout Tactics sets the scene with a group finding shelter in one of the many vaults constructed in preparation of the Great War. Before the whole network of vaults could be completed, an atomic war would ravage the planet, forcing this squad to bunk up with scientists from the vault. The group would learn that these scientists were experimenting on humans in cruel ways and put a stop to it. Emerging from the vault when they believed it was all clear, they took to calling themselves the Brotherhood of Steel, cleansing the wasteland of many dangers in the coming years. They would search for valuable technology and seek to rebuild their civilization. The Brotherhood, now struggling to provide for the needs of the new recruits, started to fracture due to internal politics. While a vast majority wanted to keep the Brotherhood of Steel exclusive, there was a group within the ranks that wanted to recruit tribals in the area. This culminated with the minority seeking to beef up the ranks being sent across the mountains on great airships. Due to a spectacular lightning storm, most of these ships would crash, 
and the survivors would land near the ruins of Chicago, with no way of contacting the main base. In the face of adversity, these Brotherhood soldiers would forge relationships with the local tribals. Many of them were impressed by this equipment and technology that was alien to them. The Midwestern Brotherhood would be founded on these relationships, and the locals would become, with open arms, a part of the ranks. Both had a lot to offer the other, and it was a solid friendship indeed. The group would move forward with these inclusive ideals. Fallout Tactics welcomes us with a beautiful shot of Chicago. Panning out, it's revealed to be an old magazine that has undoubtedly been out here for a while. Swelling blues guitar is heard in the distance as vehicles begin to appear at the ruins of this old roadside stop that we're now inspecting. A Hummer pulls over after being directed to by an unseen voice, and it's revealed that the magazine is gone from the rack as we see the Brotherhood of Steel logo on the Hummer when it pulls away. We then see the Hummer tearing ass through the wasteland, and as the magazine is thrown from the truck, we can see the city limit signs of Chicago. And a final shot revealing the ruins of the city. Then, Ron Perlman welcomes us to the game in his iconic way. War. War never changes. It was the inevitable result of the path humanity had chosen. Everyone who entered into the conflict expected victory. Everyone was optimistic. But as the hostilities escalated, optimism faded, and society began to collapse. The great vaults were built to house the wealthy, the powerful, the influential, and those deemed necessary to their survival. Inside, resources and technology were stockpiled, a final defense against the coming Holocaust. With the past behind them and the present destroyed, they looked to the future. The sturdy Vault Zero was to be the nucleus of the Vault Network, housing the greatest leaders, artists, and scientists. The inhabitants of Vault Zero were to reunite the vaults and lead the people to a new life, a new world. But after the bombs, the world would be a harsh one. To ensure the creation of a post-nuclear utopia, the Vault Dwellers would need help. Machinery was constructed to tame a land hardened by the ravages of war, then tempered by nuclear winter. But plans were barely in place when the first missiles left the silos. During the destruction, communication between the vaults ceased. Entire vaults were lost. Those that survived were on their own. Not all vaults succumbed to the machinations of war. On North America's west coast, one group of military vault dwellers emerged almost unscathed. They surveyed the wasteland and squared their shoulders for the task ahead. These dedicated survivors salvaged the technology from the vaults, technology that was studied, replicated, and fiercely guarded. For they knew that while their power came from numbers, their future lay in scientific knowledge. In time, they formed the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood used their knowledge to drive back the atrocities of the Wasteland, proclaiming themselves the technological saviors of mankind. They scoured the land in search of more technology, raiding mutant camps, bandit towns, and the broken remains of other vaults. But even they could not keep pace with the high tolls demanded by life in the Wasteland. The Brotherhood found themselves at odds with their need for new blood versus their code of technological secrecy. The debate was lengthy. Finally, the elders ruled against sharing the technology with outsiders, convinced that they would endure as they had before. Further discussion was discouraged, and the elders ordered the minority on a mission across the wastes. Super mutants, the foot soldiers of a conquered army, had been forced into a retreat across the mountainous barrier to the east. The Brotherhood constructed airships and dispatched the minority to track down and assess the extent of the remaining super mutant threat. But disaster struck while crossing the Great Mountains. A great storm gripped the main airship and flung it far from its course. The mighty ship was badly damaged. The smaller sections were torn from the main craft, never to be seen again. Many of the expedition's leaders were lost to the winds. The fraction of the crew that still survived struggled to keep their ship aloft before finally crashing on the outskirts of a once thriving metropolis. A city once called 
Chicago. Broken, scattered, and scarred, they took stock of the situation and once again squared their shoulders to the task ahead. The Brotherhood had much to offer the surrounding villages. They traded advanced medicines in exchange for food and labor. They traded protection from bandits in exchange for new recruits. In time, their ranks began to swell. Separated by distance and ideology from the main Brotherhood forces, the minority was free to forge a new Brotherhood of Steel, one that reflected the ideals they had strived for all along. However, one's future in the wasteland is never certain, for an old power has awakened, also bent on making this land its own. Life in the Brotherhood is about to change. Amen, Jesus! By the start of the game, the Brotherhood is trying to take territory surrounding Chicago. With the protection the Brotherhood is giving to the villages in the area, they can recruit the tribals that live in them. We take the role of the warrior, an initiate of the Brotherhood of Steel, leading a squad of available initiates in a campaign against the raiders that have been causing trouble in the area. The team is tasked with taking out all of the bandit leaders. Once the raiders have been driven into the wasteland, we are accepted further into the ranks of the Brotherhood of Steel. It's revealed that the mission of the Brotherhood is to push west into the Great Plains towards the Rocky Mountains in search of Vault Zero, the command center of the pre-war Vault Network, a literal Brotherhood of Steel wet dream, filled with the highest technology available. Eventually, we will come to a faction known as the Beast Lords. They can control animals of the wasteland, most importantly Deathclaws, and after some difficult battles, the Brotherhood, of course, are victorious. Pushing into Missouri, the Brotherhood are outgunned by the super mutant army that they were sent to destroy. And General Bernanke, head of the Brotherhood, is captured by Tokamata, the leader of the mutant army outside of St. Louis. While looking for a munitions manufacturing plant, the Brotherhood finds a laboratory dedicated to curing mutant sterility. All of this is pretty small potatoes once we get to Gravestone, a ghoul town in the ruins of Kansas City. Brotherhood scouts find an intact nuclear bomb. Of course, after waves of mutant attacks, the Brotherhood is able to move the bomb to one of their bunkers. Reports come in that Osceola holds the mutant base, very close to one of the wrecked Zeppelins. Inside, the Brotherhood finds a dying Takamata. We find out that General Bernanke has been lost to an enemy considered far too strong by even the mutants themselves, an enemy from the west. We also find Paladin Latham here, one of the leaders of the Brotherhood Air Convoy. Apparently after crashing, this guy fought Gamoran in a hand-to-hand -hand combat for leadership of the mutants. Though he won the battle, he also won a pretty stylish head wound, which would become infected, leading to delusional behavior. Latham admits he assumed the identity of Gamoran and led this army against us, and he pays the price for his deeds. The Brotherhood soon finds out that the threat from the West is an army of robots that have been sweeping the American Midwest, and we meet the Reavers who are perhaps more obsessed with technology than the Brotherhood, so they must be stopped. After getting their ass kicked to oblivion, the Reavers seek shelter in the Brotherhood ranks, offering an electromagnetic pulse weapon as a peace treaty. The Brotherhood accepts and destroys a robot repair plant on its way into Colorado, getting closer to the mysterious Vault Zero, where the robots have been coming from the whole time. They are being directed by an ambiguous asshole known as the Calculator. Somehow this calculator was formed from computer parts and human brains, making it a supervillain by proxy. Eventually, destroying the robot manufacturing plant, the Brotherhood still catches the ire of the robots when Bartholomew Kerr, a merchant that frequents the bunkers, is kidnapped. The biggest problem lies in the fact that Bart knows where these bunkers are, and if he gives this information to the robots, it could be pretty bad for the Brotherhood. The group gets in there before the details are shared, but it costs Bart his life. And we can also find the lobotomized body of General Bernanke, and things just got worse. The robots continue a hard campaign. The Brotherhood forms a plan to destroy them at their source in Vault Zero, nestled at the snow-filled base of Cheyenne Mountain. Before the Great War, Cheyenne Mountain housed several military command centers, North American Aerospace Defense Command, United States Northern Command, United States Strategic Command, and the Air Force Space Command. During the Cold War, the site was considered a high-priority target. Though the mountain was designed to withstand multiple direct hits from nuclear weapons, many wrote the facility off thinking it would be destroyed at any time. Vault Zero, the vault that's housed here, is not like most vaults we see. It was not involved in any experiments, as Vault Tech has been known to do. It is, however, the largest vault in form of volume ever built. This is due to the construction consisting of expansions to the Cheyenne Mountain facility. Much of the space in Vault Zero was designed initially to be the size of aircraft hangars, warehouses, and factories, these things being planned to serve the vault dwellers. 
the insane amount of war robots we find here is an insurance policy intended to ensure humanity's rebirth after the atomic war. Once the calculator goes rogue, it drives the population of the vault to extinction and initiates the pacification protocol, which had been created to kill the enemies of the people of Vault Zero. That didn't turn out too well. Using the warhead that they secured earlier, the Brotherhood plans to blow the door off the vault. And after going through the gauntlet up the slopes of Cheyenne Mountain, the Brotherhood succeed in their mission and send two squads into the vault. The first mission, turning the lights back on. The blast from the bomb has knocked the power grid offline, so a team has to go find and locate the auxiliary power so the elevators can be used. And during this, the Brotherhood's bunker is being attacked by robots. The power is restored to the vault, and we can push to the bottom level. Here we find the source of the bullshit, the last of the robot army and their leader, Cyborg General Bernacki. You can remind him of some promise he made to his wife and the general will not attack, and allow the Brotherhood to move to the calculator. Fallout Tactics offers a few different endings once all the dust is cleared. The Brotherhood will eventually destroy the robots that are guarding the brains that control the calculator and keep it alive. At this point, the calculator goes into bargaining mode, offering the warrior a chance to join minds with it to work towards world peace. The Brotherhood can do this, or if Barnacki is still alive, he can fill the role. Of course, the Brotherhood can destroy the calculator, likely the canon ending, and this sees the Midwest Brotherhood take control of the vault, but without its most precious asset, the calculator, it's little more than a tech storage shed. Since the Midwest Brotherhood of Steel is referenced in future Fallout games to be a small detachment, it's safe to say that this is the canon ending. As for the other conclusions, depending on karma, we see an army leading campaigns with the calculator at the helm, with either the warrior or Bernacki being in charge. Being an asshole leads to genocide against the unpure, and so does Bernacki. Good boy points lead to a prosperous future for all of mankind. That's nothing too ordinary out of an RPG. Fallout Tactics is one of those games that gets overlooked a lot, not just by the average consumer, but even by fans of the series. Sure, it was something different, but Tactics proves that that isn't a bad thing. With new gameplay features like changing your stance, controlling a squad in the Fallout universe, and even multiplayer skirmishes, Fallout Tactics did quite a good job offering some fun content. I highly recommend Tactics if you are a fan of the classic Fallout games. It's worth the time, and hopefully after this video, you agree. Fallout Tactics is underrated. Thank you for checking out my Fallout Tactics video. Remember, if you enjoyed watching it, to leave a like on the video and subscribe for more Fallout content. It can really help the channel out. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members. Your support means so much to me, and I'm super grateful. Shout out to my biggest supporters, Kim Jong-un, Mark Train, Irwin, Fireflare, Primark Mustard, and Corbin King. If you want to see your name in these credits or even get a shout out, check out the links below to become a supporter today. Thanks again. I'll catch you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Looking extra fly For the day you die You gon' trust the sky You gon' trust the sky, baby girl Testify Come up in the spot looking extra fly For the day you die